Every chronic condition you ever deal with has got a traumatic template to it. Autoimmune disease, I'm talking about addiction, I'm talking about mental health conditions, malignancy. These are not just sort of insights. The science is there. The science of mind-body unity and the relationship of trauma and to physical and mental pathology, or what we call pathology, is so well established in the scientific literature, and yet this is science that's utterly ignored in medical training and in medical practice. So people go to physicians and they're seen as the bearers of individual biological organs, each with its own pathology. And the connections between that person's life, that person's existence, that person's relationship to the world and fundamentally their relationship to themselves is completely missing. Which is why you and I get to learn so much and do this work. And uh, with that, I'd like to turn it to your work, if that's okay. And the uh, well, well, first thing I want to ask you, Amy, is um, I look at your um, credentials and, and all the training that you've had, uh, general surgery and functional medicine and preventive medicine and public health and addiction medicine. First of all, how is there time in one lifetime to do all that training? But secondly, and most importantly, actually, what is it that impelled you to explore all those fields? I started out with a very conventional medical pathway, and that I assumed that that's where I was going to be because that's all I knew, Gobert. Like, that's all I knew. I'm assuming yeah. it might have been the same for you, that when you go into medicine, even before you get to medical school, like the path is already laid out for you. You already yeah. know that you're going to pick a specialty, a field, but then you go through medical school, residency, and then you work in a hospital or a clinic, and this is what you do the rest of your life. And so yeah. for me, looking back, there were two events that completely changed my course of my career. And the first was that coming out of my master's in biochemistry, and before jumping into third year of medicine or medical school, I decided to become a foster parent. Mm -hmm. And four-year-old Miguel landed in my home at that time and because of what the social workers told me would be his trajectory if he were not adopted, given his history, given his behaviors, given the extent to which he had already failed several home placements in the past, I still made the decision as a third year medical student to adopt him. And it was with the intention of giving him the best chances to have a different life than what I saw unfolding before him given yeah. what I knew from from other children who had similar uh, degrees to which their trauma was showing up in their life. Yeah. And in the process, it was very hard. And his behaviors at that time were so extreme that most people wouldn't believe me when I tell them that he tried to kill me. He would pull out knives. He would talk about killing me. He would destroy things all around him in his rages. And my home became someplace where I did not feel safe. And, and this is what fueled me. This is what drove me to trying to figure out what was going on. Why was he doing this? Help me understand so that I knew how to help him. But before I could help him, I knew that I needed to understand it. And none yeah. of my training in medical school prepared me for this. The solution at that time, and probably still is, let's medicate him. Oh, but that's not, that's not the real problem. <laughs> and so that's what drove me initially. Then in 2014, I developed uh, severe fatigue, and I was now at the end of my third year of general surgery residency, transplant surgery rotation, no less, Gover, and my body gave out. And I... Sorry, just sorry to interrupt, but you know, I, one of my previous books is called When the Body Says No. And <laughs> and really, literally, your body was saying no. And that's when I found that book of yours. And that's when huh. you started to become a heavy influence in my life. And, and mm. this is what happened was I started to see my symptoms as expressions of trauma, as expressions huh. of my body telling me something that I had never been willing to listen to before. Yeah. And this is what then changed my whole personal journey because up until now, it had all been about Miguel. 
and yeah. he was finally in a good place. But now this became about me and what I first had to learn from your book primarily was that, wait a second, the, these symptoms that I'm having, because it really wasn't just the fatigue, it was anxiety and depression and my autoimmune markers were high and I had all of these other things going on that I found out. And I realized, wait a second, these are all conditions that I know from my studies now are related to adverse childhood experiences. Yeah. But yet, Gabra, that was not my story, or at least so I thought, right? Like mm -hmm. I didn't have the background that Miguel had. So yeah. why would my body have the same expression as someone who had had a very hard childhood? In my mind, again, it didn't make sense. And I need to understand things. I want to understand things. So that's where that became the second event that fueled my desire to then go into functional medicine and trauma therapy trainings and somatic experiencing training, trying to figure out then the pieces for myself, my personal journey, not having any idea that it would ever turn into the work that I do. That wasn't the intention at that time. It was just, how do mm. I heal myself? There are a few diseases, very rare, that are purely genetics driven. Like if you have the gene, you'll have the disease. Um, in my family, there's muscular dystrophy. Th those people that inherit the gene, they'll have the disease. Uh, Huntington's Korea, if you have the gene, 99% of the time you're gonna have the disease. But most diseases are not like that. Those diseases are very, very rare. There are some diseases where there's some genetic predisposition, like in some cases of breast cancer. Uh, there are breast cancer genes, ovarian cancer genes, but out of 100 women with breast cancer, only seven have the gene. 93 do not. Um, so in most cases, even if genes are present, they don't determine the disease. And in most cases, in the vast majority of uh, medical conditions, there's no significant genetic contribution at all. None. Um, not in terms of determining disease. And I talk about this in the myth of normal, and it's one of these um, myths that addiction is genetic and depression is genetic and autoimmune disease. No, they're not. They're not, there's very little proof for that. In fact, lots of proof to the opposite. When it comes to the nervous system, um, people need to understand that the relation, that, that these systems don't separate, don't, don't function in separation from each other. It's not like we have an immune system and a, and a nervous system and a gut and a, and, a, and a cardiovascular system and an emotional system. These are not separate systems. They're all one part of one unit. They're all connected. They're not even connected, they're one. So that when you talk about calming the nervous system, it's, I think you're talking about calming a nervous system that has been dysregulated by a lifetime of trauma and stress. Isn't that right? It's not just a nervous system in isolation. No, it's, it's the body system. It's a whole body living like you say in this place of stress and trauma and what that has created is a lifetime of living in fear a lifetime yeah. of feeling insecure and all of the cellular responses to living in fear because it's not just our emotions that we get guarded and, and we brace and we try to protect ourselves like that's happening on a cellular level too and then that's what becomes our health symptoms as much as i am still a medical physician and so I am very interested in how the biology affects our nervous system and can hold us back or hold us stuck. Yeah. I found that that's not where I need to start people. I actually need to start people with this connection with their body and creating yeah. different experiences for themselves first. And even with that, Gobber, I started to see changes in their biology just from doing those exercises. And that's what affirmed for me that this is the work that also changes our biology we can't we can't separate it and it's an essential yeah. piece for me it's become the foundational piece in the foundational journey so i start everyone with creating teaching them for themselves how to do this how to create a felt sense of safety for their body now i know that sounds simple and yet for anyone who is like me sounds like has been like you in the past where we love to live in our heads we love to work, we love to study, we love to think, but actually feel, that for me was a very hard step. Some, somehow, like that journey between my head and my body was 
the farthest journey I've ever had to take. <laughs>